Okay. So this is the discussion on what naturalness means to beverages other than natural wine. It's a very interesting topic with a very boring title, right? And I think we're gonna we're gonna find that as as, as we go through this, you know. Um, just you know, I can see that actually one person in the audience knows who I am. So um, I'll just you know, since we're gonna arrange that, I'll start with myself. Um, my name is Arnold. Um, I've been involved in the natural wine world for I don't know quite a while. Um, I first got the bug by tasting some wines from Beaujolais from David Lilly and Jamie Fox, who are the founders of Chamber Street Wine here in New York 12 or 13 years ago. And about nine years ago, I started blogging on it and a bunch of other things. And I'm kind of really excited about this because it's going to stretch our ideas on things. And it's also, my interest is not just natural wine, it's really kind of natural wine, how it impacts the changes of the culture and the marketplace that's developing around it and how we're all thinking about what we eat and drink and health and wellness. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with this as well. But before I start, I thought I should put some context on it because it feels a little bit nebulous, you know, what does naturalness mean? So the context that I want to kind of think about this is, is that um, I sent a note out to, um, I don't know, a couple hundred people who read my blogs, you know, just random people from all over the place, and I said, you know, what is natural wine? Because, uh, you know, we all here believe that it's a definition that we know what it is, right? You know, we think we know what it is. We buy it, we think about it, we make decisions on it. The winemakers and other people actually have ethical criteria about it, and it actually came back as being pretty interesting. They basically just said it's wine made from grapes, naturally without additives, with mineral intervention from organic fruit. Right, and these are people. You know, these are 300 out of 20,000 people that randomly replied, um, and it made me think that we do have it there. And that surprised me, not at all, but it sets the scene for talking about what these individuals are making with one codicil that I wanted to put in there. Um, I invested in a natural foods company, and what I discovered that is is that every possible segment of the natural foods business is certified and legislated by the government, except for wine. So it's really interesting to me that natural wine, which has a definition with all of us have some feeling of what it is, really has no certifications except for organic, has no body that tells anybody what it means, but it seems to be working. And I think that this openness and transparency and generality of it is what makes it work and what makes this panel actually interesting as well, because if you extract that one point further, what you realize is, is that, you know, by being open, it's not legislating taste, and by being, you know, completely unlegislated, what it's meaning is that what people express is not how things should taste, but they expect a diversity of taste from the things that fall under the category of natural. And I think this is gonna be very true in what we're doing here, because I have to admit that when I thought about mead and cider and vermouth, I really don't think about a lot until I started to dig into it. And I think it's been a little bit of a revelation for me. So I'm Arnold. Um, the people on the panel here, what I think we're going to do just to start, and then I have some questions, which I hope we'll make in subsequent discussions. And at the end, we can uh, have some questions. Just kind of just introduce yourself, just who you are, just quickly. Like, who you are, where you work, what you make, and it's really interesting to know how long you've been doing it, what you were doing the day before you started. Go ahead. So I'm, I'm Joe Bonnet. I'm uh, uh, only wine maker in, uh, in the north of uh, Quebec, in uh, what we call uh, haute Laurentide, so upper Laurentian, three hours north of Montreal. Uh, we are a, a beekeeper family since uh, the end of the 70s, and uh, my father-in-law uh, and my mother-in-law start making meat in, um, in uh, 1990. And uh, so we are organic certified in for the only since uh, 2003, and uh, for me the, since uh, 2009. And we start uh, uh, to be really uh, uh, natural uh, winemaking in 2011. Uh, because before that we were still using some some yeast, uh, and then we start uh, to make uh, uh, yes, we, we wanted to make something really more natural, so we start to use uh, uh, leaven made from uh, 
from Poland and Ronnie. Um, and yeah, but that's a bit uh, refining. And uh, in my mind, we also we can have some different kind of uh, mead of or only wine. Uh, we are more working on um, uh, speaking about only wines with uh, each uh, honey we made at each season because because at, uh, at each season we have a uh, different landscape, uh, flowery landscape and uh, so that uh, bring us a uh, uh, like typical uh, flavor for each honey and uh, so we start, we work uh, this kind of honey like uh, cepage in the wine uh, and but we have also what I call a bit more mid but mean a bit short uh, a sh short process uh, and we can use in this kind of uh, meal uh, spices, herbs, fruits and uh, yeah that's, uh, that's a bit of a different uh, sort of uh, wine or only wine we make. And you're from France, were you a winemaker in France or did you do something different? No, I was working in, on Oni in Corsica, I was working for, um, they have an AOC like in wine on the honey. Oh really? And so uh, I'm, I'm coming from the honey, and then uh, I have a lot of friends that are uh, winemakers in France. And uh, I met my, my wife, <laughs> uh, she was already making meat, so it was like, uh, uh, like uh, I don't know, <laughs> it was a start. Perfect. Okay, uh, my name is John Piana, and I'm from Vermont. And I've been making cider and dabbling in honey wine, um, and maple wines, cider since 2009. Uh, but I've been farming vegetables for since 2007, and just this year is the first year that I've stopped farming vegetables, and that just demands. It demanded so much of my energy, um, and I feel like the some of the ciders I brought today uh, to the raw wine fair kind of reflect that because they're 2013 ciders, and they're, it's, I'm at a time where like I'm just kind of like a farmer, artist, crazy person trying to find my balance, and um, my my ciders show to be a little rustic in that in that way just really raw, really vulnerable. Um, so I, um, I I basically, we started making cider because we were drawn to fermentation, we were drawn to plant medicine, and we, we basically saw apples falling everywhere and rotting back into the ground, and we kind of just recognized it as a free energy source to propagate our passion for fermentation. Um, thought perhaps I'd start growing barley and hops and making sour beer, but that quickly dwindled in the face of the opportunism of apples. Um, and same with honey, like started thinking about me, uh, but the vegetable farm kept me from keeping the hives in the way that we really need to keep them paying attention and really being part of the hive. So we, so for the meads, we've, we're sort of doing it on the, on the side. We've been buying honey wholesale from various uh, places, North Dakota, organic um, honey from, I have a good friend, mutual friends, Todd Hardy, who um, has Caledonia wine and spirits, who's really kind of took me under his wing and brings me honey and all sorts of stuff. And so I've, I've, my meads have been like, I basically take tree sap and I and I use the tree sap as the water source for the for the meats um, and I keep it raw. I don't I don't use any heat um, and so those are all kind of in process. And while our ciders are hitting the market, we're we're dabbling in, in that. So I kind of think that what I represent is sort of someone who just crosses boundaries. I'm like constantly. Anytime someone puts me in a box, I'm like. Just trying to get the hell out of the box <laughs> and blend, blend across the board. So I'm a big blender, mixologist, uh, farmer person. You mean like I try to put you in a box? When I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I'll just start breaking that down. Yeah. <laughs> 
the fuck you to the core, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to the core. Uh, yeah, well, up until very recently, I was a one-woman army. Uh, now I have a couple of people working with me as a result of buying a farm last summer in Saugerties, New York, so I'm now a farmer. Uh, very new for me. I did grow up with uh, Plant Whisper for a mother, so, you know, we did have, like, a ton of gardens <coughs> all over the place, um, but, you know, not like, not like, you know, the life that I'm apparently changing into, but uh, I started my company on Cooth for Ruth in Brooklyn in, uh, illegally in 2011, as one does. Um, I think that every single person I know who didn't start with an investor had to kind of move like to a degree. Uh, so I was a consultant for the first year, and then I incubated my business in the Red Hook Winery, which is a group of really wonderful people who have been creating a super cool ecosystem in their place since 2008. And uh, being a bootstrapper, I didn't have enough to kind of have like a full on operation. So, crush to tank, we bring in grapes from the North Fork and the Finger Lakes and uh, make them at Red Oak Winery. I take them either finished or unfinished and fuck them up and turn them into vermouth. Um, nobody really knows what vermouth is. That was something I was going to ask you. I think, <laughs> yeah, let's start there. Uh, so, vermouth is defined as aromatized fortified wine, right? So we were talking about this when I first walked in. I hate the word botanical. Uh, I always say edible plant, and the reason I say that is because edible specifically just means non-toxic, right? So you can ingest it, and it's hopefully not going to harm you, um, you know, with the exception of the people who have food allergies, obviously. And so the term edible plant, I think, is very important for me, you know, um, a lot of bartenders will show me their vermouths that they've made, and you know, I, ha I have to say that many times there's something in it that you know, of course, is as a plant smells delicious but not edible at all. Somebody once tried to give me a sweet pea flower vermouth, and sweet pea flowers like are great in perfume, but uh, when you ingest them, they can cause major fucking nerve damage. And, you know, it's not okay. It's not okay. So anyway. Uh, tobacco bitters, don't ever drink fucking tobacco bitters. Like, to, like nicotine can stop your heart. Like, and that shit gets amplified in alcohol, so that's just suicide. Um, but tobacco bitters were really hot in New York City. I know a lot of you guys aren't from here, but they were really hot in New York City a few years ago, and I had to start bitching people out, but whatever. Um, so edible plants, aromatic plants, aromatized wine, means you're putting plants in wine. That's pretty easy, fortification refers to jumping up the alcohol percentage by adding a fruit spirit. For my purposes, I use single distilled. I guess it's technically twice distilled. It's one pass through a combo still. Uh, native New York called the Catawba grape. I'm sure you've never heard of it. Um, maybe you have. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so Catawba makes kind of shitty wine, but it makes pretty good brandy. And because it's native to the Finger Lakes region, um, you can grow it organically pretty easily. So. Uh, that's what I'm into, and they make it specially for me at Finger Lakes Distilling. So I have partnerships, even though I have always been like a one-person operation, I've formed some pretty lucky partnerships with people who give a shit about me and uh, help me, you know, make the highest possible quality vermouth, um, which I do claim to make. And it's not ego, it's drive, it's, you know, insistence, like, I don't compromise if there's a shitty harvest or you know, like we had like a really wet season. We had a, we had a crazy year. Can we talk about that? We had like the craziest year ever for everybody, right? Like we had this heat wave in early March, and then we had a frost because we're all basically from the same area. And so, for apple trees, did they blossom for you guys in March and then freeze? Did you no, get any black frost? We didn't get that this year. So the Hudson Valley was creamed from this frost. Um, everybody I know in southwest France was fucked and had to buy fruit and juice from other places just to keep their business alive. You know, one vintage can like wipe out your business. Uh, so anyway, I make like eight to ten things throughout the year to try and avoid that because I don't want to compromise. So if it's a shitty harvest or somebody's like fun just signing it up, I just don't want it. And, um, you know, I forage anything that I can because that's the cleanest possible ingredient that you can use. 
um, because farming is a manipulation no matter what. Um, like I practice permaculture, and that means that I'm mimicking the forest, and um, would you say that's a fair way to translate permaculture? And like, but you're still manipulating the land. So I think that it's a really important conversation to, you know, talk when we talk about the word organic or the word natural. I think that the word natural is a grocery term. I think that organic is just good marketing, and I think you know, and, it, and it's. Well, we'll talk. We'll talk about that in a second. That's why I'm going to follow. That's yeah. what I'm asking something. Else. So. You have a base that's animals, right? You know, you have a base that's honey, right? What's your base? So in, in a core, so I mean, what is Love, it? Lovegory. Uh, Artemisia vulgaris. So in order for it to be removed, you need an oh. Artemisia base. Everybody thinks that it's wormwood. Um, the original EU law cited Artemisia vulgaris, not Artemisia exilia. So, um, so one could say I make the only vermouth. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> No, you could actually say that. <laughs> you don't have to tell people that, but it wouldn't be completely inaccurate. But vermouth is over 8,000 years old. Um, I cherish that shit. It's so ancient. It's so cool. Uh, every recreational drug started out as a medicine. Uh, you know, before wines were made with just grapes, they were always made with herbs. Um, so, you know, it, it, aromatized wine is just something that has always kind of fascinated me. I have a winemaking background. I spent my formative twenties in Oregon, uh, working with literally everybody. Um, you know, and basically never got paid a cent for it, but formative education. And then moved back here and kind of combined love of foraging, wine. Go ahead. Um, okay, so. Uh, so, uh, well, this is my place. So, welcome. It's a great place. This is the home of Enlightened Wines. Uh, and Honey's is our tasting room, so that's bar. And I should say, after this, if you guys want to try any of our stuff, we'll just pour it. You can taste it. You don't have to like plank for the <laughs> table space over there. Uh, we're, of course, we're all showing it at the fair. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting to hear all these different stories. So, I. I started making alcohol in 2000, and me like pretty much quickly. Started with cider. Uh, if you want to start, start with cider. It's pretty easy. Me to like the next easiest, I would say. Beer's the hardest um, because it's you know if you you know when the early days when you start playing around, you realize that some of these things are actually better off industrialized. Um, beer gets better when it gets bigger. It's distilling gets better when it gets bigger. You have more control. It's easier. Some things are better when they're smaller. Uh, cider. And I think wine in general. So, raw ingredients. Yeah, raw ingredients. raw ingredients, that's probably it, but I think it also has to just do with, um, you know, a lot of what we do, it happens at room temperature, uh, it's not super manipulative. So, for me as a meat maker, uh, that means, uh, you know, I also sort of appreciate liminal spaces, like you're talking about being in between categories. So, part of my job. Is also to like look at history and look at what the what the actual record of alcohol making is, and you know I've been doing this for a long time, just, you know, it's like 15 years, 16 years now. So there's a few things that you learn pretty fast. Um, one, there's just not a lot of information about way the way people drank a thousand years ago, five thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago. But there is actually a lot of information. It's, you know, you can read like four or five books and pretty much learn almost everything that people know. And one thing you find out really quickly, like Bianca said, is that the categories that we have today, which is that uh, we have wine, which people tend to understand as great wine, which they tend to understand as Italian and French wine, and beer, which they understand really as German beer, that that's like kind of like most of what people drink in the United States. Our categories that like are pretty arbitrary and very, very modern. So even if you go back to the kind of wine that people are drinking in Thomas Jefferson's era, we've been really different than the stuff we drink now really sweet and big stuff. And then if you go start going backwards in time, you start going back to like what the Romans drank or what people in, in you know, proto-France drank or England or any of those places, you start to realize that it's very weird. You know, it's almost all has herbs in it. It's they're mixing the categories constantly. They're putting honey in the grape wine, they're putting beer in the wine, they're putting cider in the beer, and they're mixing all this stuff up. And what you look at when you look at it, what you realize what they're doing is, is that they're looking around their environment, and they're seeing what grows here. What can we make alcohol out of? Everybody, every human culture has turned around, looked what was available, and made alcohol out of it. 
And since most uh, human cultures have had honey, they've made a honey wine. But the honey wine in Ethiopia is going to be totally different than the honey wine that's made in China or the honey wine that's made in England in the sense that they use different ingredients. But they all started making it around the same time. Yeah, but they're all making it. So like for me, it's like I like when I think about what I do and whether or not I'm a natural maker or not a natural maker, it's like I I'm really more interested in trying to reach like backwards and forwards at the same time. So like, reaching backwards in time to like I have a great deal of respect for like early makers and you know what we would call primitive or simple production methods because I think there's actually a lot to learn in there. You know, um, and then at the same time, I also recognize that need in particular, which include everything from like what's in those barrels there, which is just raw wildflower and water, wildflower honey and water, all the way to these things that I make, which are like have a fruit and herbs in them. Like you know, it's a whole spectrum. Like for me, it's it's really just about thinking like, okay, how do you innovate? How do you do something interesting that's appropriate now? But how do you learn from the techniques and tools? So let me jump here. I find this really interesting. I'm trying to think of a way to focus this in here because, you know, in, I believe in the market. Um, I believe in categories. Um, I believe that people think in them, you know, not rigidly, but we buy and feel secure around them. And would I also, I'll make a leap and presume that regardless of what you call your products, you're selling into a fairly substantial each one of you, right? The people that are buying them, right? You know, and that's kind of interesting because one of the interesting things about the natural wine market to me is that I believe, not everybody agrees, that it actually came from both places. It actually came from the producers and the makers who decided to do this and a population of people out in the world like myself who wanted it, right? And I believe that the natural wine market was actually a perfect wave of change and it's rolled into what we see in health and wellness now, what we see in what, with with rights of different minorities. I think there's a change that's happening that's becoming diverse in itself. But I don't want to go up on that. What I want to focus down on the fact is, is that it's actually a fairly simple question that I asked my readers, which said, what is natural wine? And they kind of bang, bang, bang. They sent me like 30 or 40 emails in here. But the interesting thing is that what you guys are saying is really interesting, but it's also very complex, right? You know, And I think that it's part of your responsibility or your intent to either simplify it where people can understand it or explain it in a way to want it because we want to know it, right? The difference between, and we talked about this earlier, like, you know, because when I went through your websites, hardly any of you used to call yourselves winemakers. You called yourself a farmer, right? And I don't have a relationship with the people that make my, my vegetables, right? You know, um, I buy them. I buy them from the same people every week. They put green peppers and tomatoes and all the good stuff that I eat because I'm very organic and, and with that food. But I don't love him. I don't know his name. I'm not willing to spend a lot of money. But my winemakers, I love my winemakers, right? You know, and I, I care less about the year, and I care less about, you know, um, the grape, and I care more about the place, and I care more about the person. I love these people. I support them. I pay more than market so that they can continue to do what they want. And this is, and I'm not an exception. Right, so I'm, that's so, why you can't make money off raw ingredients. Well, right? well, wait, that's, 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 so, so my question to you is, is that, you know, you are making wine of sorts, right? So, but, you know, wine is made within constraints, and these constraints when you're making great wine are fairly clear, right? You don't put any shit on the ground, right? It's got to be organic there. You don't add anything except maybe SO2 at the end, right? I mean, as a definition, this is what people think. I'm not saying there's people who don't do it, and I'm not saying it doesn't get broken. I, I, used, to ma I used to manage a natural wine shop, okay. and when people would ask me this question, Where's the closer? I would I would answer in a in a pretty in a pretty dogmatic way, and I'm going to tell you this, and then I'm going to tell you what I think now. So I so I used to say it would mean someone who doesn't use pesticides in the vineyard uh, does not um, irrigate, uh, which I still agree with everyone pisses me off, um, especially in our area because we get the most rain. Um, in places like France, uh, someone who doesn't add sulfur or yeast or chemical additives, um, you know, and, and I'm keeping sulfur separate from chemical additives for a reason, uh, because it's an antibacterial and it's an antioxidant. So I can only name 
I think, three winemakers on the planet who don't use sulfur ever at all. And one of his wines, you know, are not drinkable. Everybody uses sulfur at Crush. Every, everybody does it. You know, it could be microbial, it could be, you know, laboratory. There are differences, obviously. There are better choices to make. But right. Everybody, everybody uses You're right. sulfur. But, but what I don't want to do is comment. What I want to, what I want to kind of get our heads around and for all of us to think about is, is that, you know, it's my belief. And the, the reason I agreed to do this is that I knew nothing about your products. Now I know a lot more. Um, now I'll start to write about them and I'll, and I'll become, and I'll come visit you and we'll, we'll do all this stuff. But the issue is, is that how do you characterize your constraints and how do you think of natural when you have so many choices, right? So let's not think about, you know, the fact that maybe some other people do some stuff to natural wine. You have a lot of things. You can add herbs, you can add botanicals, you can, you can to some degree, adjust the amount of sugar, the amount of alcohol in your product. You can do a lot of things. You, you are, in a lot of ways, curators, right? You know, it's not a negative term, but curators are good thing. You're making choices by the intent of what you want your product to be, you know, about how it's going to taste, or maybe you make it an intent of what you want it to do, or maybe it has an herbal quality or something else. So how do you start to think about talking about that to someone who loves natural wine, right, to put yourself in context in their language so they can start to feel comfortable. Because I think it's an interesting discussion because we all want to have conversations with her. Maybe, with her maybe, maybe natural is not a useful word. Okay. Like, so for me, I, I'm like, what is the goal of it? Like your, your blog respondents. Right, they who like natural wine, like what is but it? But they're that? also going to like your product. Sure, because but, what, but what, is, that. what is it that they actually like? So in my mind, I, I kind of break it down. It's like there's going to be some people who like it because they think it tastes better, right? That like natural wine, and I would be one of those people. I actually yeah, think I it agree. produces a better tasting product. And so, okay. but that's not that's sort of independent of ethics and morals. The the other aspect is it is that they like the idea, I think, of a historical winemaker that they have in their head who's very rustic and very simple and sort of deeply authentic, right? That's maybe like part of this like Im Im image, which I can't really personally attach to because you know what I'm doing is very weird and obviously I, I don't have like a hundred year family history to point that to. But I think another part of it is like this thing that I brought up earlier, which is that, that the production process has an ethics and a responsibility to the land that they're from. And that part of for me like my introduction into not using chemicals and not using filters, which isn't a big deal in the natural wine world. I think it's a very big deal for, for our, our, our world. Like so the choice of using filters or not radically affects the, the flavor profile of the meat, right? Okay. So, but to be honest, like when I started, I mean, I was in a room like this big, like really, you know? And I just had a like, a, you know, I had a license and a, like, a lot of ideas and experimented, but I didn't have any money, which means, you know, I'm not buying chemicals, I'm not buying filters, I'm not buying pumps. I had a very simple winery. You could have made it in a bucket, you know, like a caveman. But through that, I learned, I started to relate to, like, I'm like, well, this is kind of probably how people made things in the 1700s. They would have been thrilled to have a carboy, this big glass thing that's light and easy to clean, and you can see inside, you know, like, and you start to realize that a lot of winemaking is just containers. Mm -hmm. And that the barrel is an amazing container, that's why I use it. But then once I found the skills to work within those parameters, then I could expand it into an ethics. So for example, like I use used red wine barrels. Now I could get them from anywhere, right? And all of it would be considered natural. But we had a choice when we started this, like where do I get these? I really wanted some white wine barrels because I hadn't made meat in a white wine barrel. But I would have had to get them from California because nobody around here makes white wine in barrels and make them stainless. So I would have had to put them on a truck and ship them out here. Or I could try and work with Red Hook Winery, who's always been supportive and Bianca has you know, introduced me to. And, and so like we use their barrels because they're already here and they use less gas. And for me, that's as important as whether or not I put myself so, so And they're all fermentation. Yeah. No, I think this is great. This is like there's so many moving pieces here. That's yeah. So do you, you consider yourself, your product natural? Yeah, I mean, for me, it started with um, yeah raw ing ingredients, and uh, yeah, in honey, I think the first thing is you don't have to eat, eat it or warm it because if you lose uh, a lot of uh, properties, you lose flavors, mm -hmm. you lose uh, enzymes, everything. Uh, you don't have to filter it because you also lose a lot of things. 
And um, yeah, I think also about uh, when you speak about bees, it's uh, you have to also to think about the foraging area, and it's, it can pretty it can be really fast. Like uh, a bee can uh, forage to three kilometers from the beehive, like five miles, five yeah. mile area. And that means for each like uh, this space, it's uh, seven thousand acres. Uh, so it's, uh, it's it can it's a lot of space. So and I think we have also to promote like um, uh, like uh, in this space, but it, it has to be uh, not wild, but maybe uh, exempt of pesticides and GMO and uh, a lot of things like this. And the good thing is that can, that could be organic certified. So so this, let like, me make sure that I, I kind of get this into my head for you. So basically. In, in your world, like it's organic because your bees are just knew nothing. Because they just, I was a beekeeper like a million years ago, and they just did whatever they wanted. Your hair is <laughs> yes, I was. I was actually, I, should, I was going to bring a picture of me, you know, having a swarm when I was 25. Right? But it was like, uh, it was great. But the, the truth of the matter is, is that, so I want to say, so are you actually considering the time of the year when the flowers are blooming as these actually being the the variety of the honey that you're taking in loop. So is that how you kind of describe varietal within the meat world? Uh, yeah, after that, uh, well, if we think just about natural, it's, uh, yeah, I think there's the respect of raw material and then you don't have, yeah, chemicals and everything. But, and then uh, what, when we think about uh, uh, transforming only in uh, something uh, with alcohol, uh, uh, we were uh, um, close, uh, I mean, uh, we drink a lot of wine, and we, um, my, my wife was a, a chef, so we had a lot of friends in uh, restoration, a lot of uh, winemakers, so in our mind, we were more going in a way of making uh, something that is closer from, from wine. Uh, and so we, uh, from this perspective, we start thinking of, of honey and different, like the different kind of honey we harvest as a, yeah, as a cepage. But what was the story? It could be something else. Like uh, we do like this. Way. But I, for I think for natural uh, to be natural, uh, it's a respect of raw material. If you use, yeah, you can use honey. You can add something else, but it has to be like foraging. Not wild, wild, maybe wild space, but also space that uh, are not uh, impacted by uh, too much agriculture or too much in intensive agriculture. Right. Yeah. I mean, I have a reason for yeah. this. So, Johnny, do you yes. think of your process is natural? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure I've got a couple different things to say. I mean, um, one has to do with the market and how we identify it. But the first thing I'd say is, I like, I kind of like, I'm like a real purist, right? And, and so like, I'm, I'm always after the, the most medicinal, natural process. But that being said, like, it's so complicated and it's so um, varied from person to person, place to place, and process to process that the, the most simplistic way I can look at natural is thinking of the word flow and what flows for the winemaker. What is the most like the path of least resistance. And right now, I, I, I almost say I'm, I'm not making natural wine because I have pressures that are outside myself that have largely to do with economics, have largely to do with time constraints, and these, these, these forces that I would prefer to do away with altogether and then come back to my core and be like, step into my power as a winemaker um, and a human on this earth and just be like, artist just making my art. You know what I mean? That to me would be the most natural wine I've made. It's all the perfect shit. Yeah. <laughs> but whatever, like I think that we're all born with that that possibility and it's like we all we're all born with the this idea that like we have to earn something, we have to we have to work hard and I'm and I'm a I'm a hard worker, you know, like with the rest of them, but I actually think that that we can envision a world where it doesn't have to be so uh, you know, so largely inspired by economic situations. Yeah. That's that's just my my own no, personal no, thing. What I'd like to say about my cider process is that um, 
I'm at a, I'm at a place where like in Vermont, most of the cider makers identify with the beer community, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so they, they kind of come at it from more of a chemical chemist approach. Than technique. Yeah, and um, I've always identified as a winemaker in the way that I make my cider. And it's, it's really hard to, to describe that to the consumer. Uh, so there's a lot of consumer education that has to go around specifically in mead and cider and vermouth because people don't know what it is. There's been this huge um, gap of culture from a historic you know, a situation where everyone was enjoying these vermouths, these meads, these ciders, and, and there was this big, this big gap, and we're kind of like putting the pieces back together, like Raphael said about kind of looking to the past and looking to the future, putting the pieces back together. So, so big part of my, my job, which I'm not really up for, is to like educate the consumer. But I, that's why I think the consumer needs to step up too, and, and we need to meet middle way, we need to tell our story and they need to take responsibility for discovering what they like and ask questions. And, ask questions. and it's this like this two-way street. I, I agree. Well, one, one question on this is I find this really interesting. So here's what you and I think would agree on, right? You know, I think that you know this concept of the natural winemaker, whether it be a mead maker or Frank Warner it doesn't really matter, you know, that they are some kind of benign shepherd of a natural process that kind of magically happens is not true. Like, you know, you know, wine is made by women and men and other people, you know, and I think that making lots of choices. Make, yeah, lots of choices. Constantly. And I think this is really important too. And I think one of the I think one of the great things that that I've learned, especially from some North American natural winemakers who have pounded this into my heads, because my first five or so years since I spent all my time in Europe. And I was spending a lot of time with sixth, seventh generation natural winemakers. It, it was very, there was a lot of flow and organic. And then I spent, started spending time in Oregon and California. And I realized that the, the people themselves are the decision maker. And they are an integral part of the expression of that terroir. And they can't be changed at all, right? But even though they have this intent and they make choices, they're still dealing with some kind of constraints with, for lack of, of a better word or not, we consider them natural. And then this has been at least, at least from a market perspective, and I'm not arguing for it, you know, and maybe it's a different time. You know, maybe this was like six, seven, eight years ago when we were all fighting this shit against the industry and industrialized farms and like, you know, all the magazines were calling it shit and muddy and all the other crap, you know, maybe it's a different time. Maybe what your products are is you're coming into a new generation where you can be more flexible because you have a base of understanding from a marketplace to support you. I, I don't know that, but I'm just I'm interested that the fact that the the term kind of bugs you. Well, I think part of it means partially our age, I would say, and, sure. and I think uh, also like I didn't come up through wine, so I never got indoctrinated. It's the first time I even heard anybody tell tell the story that I just assumed that like. When natural wine came out of where people always liked it. Like I didn't even know that that, that it was like kind of shit on for a while. So Trust me, it was yeah. a fight. <laughs> so I, I I respect all that, but I also like, you know, I've spent a fair amount of time in like, you know, let's say like Italy, like northern Italy, right? And you go to northern Italy and there's like all these mountains and all these, you know, and I have a good friend who lives in Vernasca and he's got a town of hundred people. And you start to get it. Like you start to get it that in Vernasca there's bad bread and there's bad cheese, but they make this one really good bread. And then you go to the other town, which you have to go over the mountain, and their vinegar isn't so good, but they have a little cheese that they make that's special there, and they're really proud of it. And I mean really, that's re they're really proud. And in, in a place like that, which is a, Italy, you know, which isn't even a real country, you know, it's put together in the 40s, like, people's identities are really locked into these small little isolated places where, in the old days, and I mean a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, people couldn't travel around like they do. So if you have a really good cheese and you come to town, it makes sense that people share that. And I really, I understand it, I really respect it. It doesn't make any sense in a real way for me to pretend that that's the world we live in now. So we have all these choices. And for me, it's like, you know, do I get my yarrow from California? Or do I have to work with a farmer upstate? And you know, like, I have a farm winery license, so all my ingredients are supposed to come from New York, but they really only mean fermentable ingredients. So actually, my difficult decision come down to the herbs that I use. 
And like for me, what I'm trying to do is, yeah, you can pass around the yard. This is fun. I wouldn't, it's very bitter. Um, but like, this is a really special thing because it's just the flower tops, right? And I can get that in New York by working with the farmer and growing, you know, growing an industry. But my distinction at the end of the day, which I think is sort of really interesting question for you, is like, I don't think about natural as much as I think about living. I really think about this as biology. I think that's something you mentioned too. Like my friends who are brewers who make mead, they, they never make really good mead because they think of it as chemistry. And like when I look at those barrels and look at it every day, it's alive. That thing's breathing, you know? So I care about living worlds. I want my wine to be alive. I want it to change over time. I want it to stabilize. I want it to have to be an ecosystem. I want you to drink an ecosystem. I, I love that. So basically what you're doing, which is you're challenging me from a different generation, which is perfect, right? You're basically saying, so there's concepts of natural that maybe we've all layered into our wines, and the sommeliers and other ones out here today who use this term as good for us to think about is maybe the wrong term. But you're not saying, so should we throw it all away? Should we throw the concept of terroir? Should we throw the concept of local? I'm just trying to think, what are the criteria of choice, right? Because we all start with liking something, right? Yeah. You know, do you like it or do you not? And we all draw the line somewhere. Some, somewhere we, and that line is defining of who you are and the product that you make, right? So, and I think it's actually interesting because I think it's actually going kind to of be kind of fascinating because, you know, you guys both make great things, right? But I think they're very different, right? I think, you know, not only they're very different because you're very different people, but you're drawing the lines differently, you know? From what I hear, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to put words anywhere, though, you know, place is really important to you. You know, I mean, you're an acres, right? You know, I mean, so place and the environment that your bees work in and the way that you, quote, naturally incubate yeast from pollen and other things that you do within your craft are core to what you do. And it's, it's the story that you want people to realize when they drink it, right? Your story may be. It's what they're tasting. Yeah, it's because, yeah, I'm not a big believer in like Disney. I don't care. I care about all these things wrapped together. But I think that, you know, your story might be different, even though the core, you're both making honey wine, right? Yeah, I mean, I think as making honey, I don't make honey. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm literally afraid to make honey. I feel like I won't come back. It's like too interesting, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I don't have that constraint, but I do work with a single farmer. Mm -hmm. And so it's like as close as I get. I have a relationship. It's like a negotiation. Yeah, right. and uh, but yeah, I mean, I work on a farm, and it, like, if I had could pull all the honey off my farm, I think it would be more like powerful experience for me. I, I don't know if it would, and I'd probably be more interested in uh, transmitting the flavor of the honey rather than using the honey as a carrot. But I think both of us make natural meals, right? It's an aesthetic choice in there. Um, but what's interesting about it to me is that I don't think a great wine producer would say that. I think grape wine producers almost consistently interested in transmitting the like the fruit. And in some of my wines, like uh, you know, if I make a black currant mead, I don't know if you can maybe kind of smell the honey a little bit. It's really a carrier. So it allows me to use these other fruits and herbs which I really like and bring them into the wine. Yeah, no, I, I think it's good. I think we're actually and it allows for a stronger fermentation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like how they, they work together. Yeah, yeah. So but, the so the concept of place for I mean, it just seems to be so many interesting variables. Right. You know, I mean, so if you start with honey or you start with apples, right, and I don't mean to slight you, just that we have two bee makers here, so it's, we to think, is that, you know, there are a bunch of things that you can decide on. Right? There's so many choices that you make, you know, and then you can also decide on your, now that I know there's a difference between herbs and botanicals, right, you know, which ones you want. And you will decide whether or not your constraints are to what you can walk out your door and get. Are your constraints, or you can find someplace that's special that would still make it what you want. Well, like, all right, there's some sumac hanging out, which is uh -huh. a red plant. I've been working with that plant for years, and it mm -hmm. is gives you some constraints. That stuff does not dry well. It does not store. You've got to use it when it's done. When it's ready, you've got to use it. Or you can freeze dry it. Yeah, you freeze, yeah. But you know what I mean? It's like, and then. I've done that. Yeah. I totally dry it in there. Oh, but if you can dry it, but it's freshly dry. Yeah, but if you compare it, it looks like that. Like fresh, Fresh to dry, like I think the fresh stuff, and but this is opinions, right? Yeah, yeah. But in my experience, like when I may be it and I keep some in the refrigerator and I wait a week and dry some out and I compare the actual same plants, like I think it's just vastly superior fresh. So for me, I get like about a month to work with that stuff. When I make my dandelion wine, I get two weeks 
I have two weeks to pick the entire amount of dandelions I'm going to use for the rest of the year for one line. So I got constraints. You know, <laughs> they're, they're very real. And you have to work with time, you have to work with the weather. The cherry crop failed this year. I won't be making cherry wine. I'm not going to import it from Michigan. You know, so I think we. we made I didn't make a cherry vermouth this year either. Did you guys have to sacrifice any? I, when you said you didn't get it with the frost, I remember. Yeah, but this year we didn't have like uh, no, uh, uh, linden or like some onion, yeah, white metal, because yeah, it was in uh, the, the, uh, the flower came usually in the middle of July, but it was really uh, cold in the night, and so the bees won't, didn't go out uh, in the morning, just at the end of the afternoon, and, and then there was also a lot of other flowers, so it was all made, and we didn't have like really enough of, of uh, but every year we have like different. Yeah. Uh, what we want to do is also it's uh, because we are living really far away also, and we want to express uh, uh, our territory because we also think that uh, if people uh, drink our stuff somewhere else, they also want to travel through the product. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you can think about. Uh, what the taste, the taste of your wine should be, but uh, I think it has to express something. And in our, what we do is we express our territory. Even if we put flavor in, inside, uh, like herbs or uh, even herbs, uh, mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's all from somewhere, somewhere around. And uh, and also because we want to build uh, the economy around us. It was a place where uh, uh, forestry was really high in. Uh, until the middle of uh, 2000, but now it's really crushed down, and uh, and we need to also uh, give some inspiration about or in the in the region to to create also uh, economy. So and uh, and we want to inspire people to to go in the natural well, natural way. And uh, the good thing is that uh, we have a lot of farmer that are now going in organic certification because it's also a market for crops, for cereal, for uh, also for meal. And I think it's a good step because for us, it's, uh, 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 it's a chance to have a, a wide territory or something exempt of pesticides and we want also to express that. In, you know. So, I don't know, we started late, so can I steal 10 more minutes? Yeah. Um, would we, should we give it to you, or should we give it to me and ask questions? Are there some questions? I think it's really important. And I knew that at the beginning of this, that if it was interesting, we were going to be all over the place, which I think is great, because it's raised a lot of questions, and I could sit here all day and talk this, but... I mean, really, right? we all kind of work with a lot of the same, I mean, I don't yeah. uh, work with honey for vermouth, I make a, like a bunch of shit, you know, dabble, as you say, we all, right. dabble, we all dabble with like I mean, I like, we all have jars of all kinds of shit all over our houses, you know, like bubbling <laughs> to yeah, some degree. Right. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, I think that what we all have in common and with every winemaker, you know, that's next door is that what we're doing is exactly what they're doing in the sense that we're showing you terroir and we're showing you a sense of place. It's just not specific to just grapes. And the reason that I thought that it would be more important for me to combine interests and focus on something that deals with, you know, a couple hundred edible plants throughout the year is, you know, first of all, the whole world doesn't know that upstate New York exists. They think that it's Vermont. They just think that there's a dirty little city and then Vermont. Um, so there's that. Like, doing this in Europe is really fun. And, uh, and you know, and, and also because I really want to raise awareness that wine is food and that what goes in your glass is just as important as what's on your plate. I think that's why everybody is here. And... You know, also I think that grapes for the most part are a monoculture, and I think that that's very dangerous for the entire world and for, you know, even the specific vineyards. Like, I know a lot of winemakers who claim to practice biodynamically, but they only grow grapes. So if you know anything about biodynamics, that's totally impossible. So, right, and so I think biodiversity is of the utmost importance to keep all our fucking bees alive. You know, and, and encourage everybody's bees to stay healthy and encourage, you know, I mean, it's not to, you can do it in so many different extreme or personal tiny ways in your own life to help keep moving that, you know, worldwide. 
I, I know some people who think that the way to do it is to set fire to Monsanto farms in the middle of the night, and I'm not condoning or encouraging, but you know, I hope well, they keep it up. And uh, <laughs> you know, and you know, and, and, and that's the other thing about you know the natural wine world is that there's there are so there are just so many like we're we're like weird offshoots of that of this whole movement, of course, you know. Brought, you know, brought into it one way or another, but we exist in the same world. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's, there are so many people who are taking actions in different ways to, to really try and encourage, you know, a, it's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle, you know, not a job. And so trying to encourage people to live, you know, just more cleanly and care about each other more, I think, right? So I have one thing to wrap this up with. Before I do this, we should have questions. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to give it out to them. That's the, absolutely. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. So. I have a question. Can I ask a question? Please. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in scale. And, and I'm interested in how um, your lives, you're all successful. You may not be paying your rent, but you are all successful in your various endeavors. And I'm interested in how your lives have changed as you've gotten more successful and how you preserve the sort of purity of heart that all started from small. How do you preserve that? What you might tell the next generation about preserving? Maybe say no. Maybe say no to them. I don't know. That's a that's an awesome question. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, I think we talk about it a lot here. You know, this is still for tiny, but this was huge for me. Like scaling up. We, you know, we had to write a business plan and get investors, and we're still doing that kind of thing. You know, so we have to we have responsibility to return the money that's invested and make them money. But we also want to like keep our ethical kind of place. And I think the big question was scale and how do you scale and how do you scale and distribute and maintain your sort of ideas about how this sort of kind of thing would work. Um, and for us, what we realized that is that like, like you know, we have a lot of friends in LA. We love to have our media in LA. We can afford to make enough to start shipping it kind of thing, right? But it's like, it doesn't make any sense. Like the whole point of this place is to have a close relationship to the land and the product. Like, all this stuff comes from nearby. Like, we live here, all this stuff. Like, how does it make any sense to then ship that to LA? And the consumer, because you sell mostly through your CSA. Yeah, well, yeah, directly now through the bar and, and through mailing lists and stuff. But so, but then we realized, like, you know what would be awesome is, like, we could just make another one of these out. And then we could have a, a, an electric line to California and use lemons and all these amazing things that we can't use here. And, like, there's so a for, season. Yeah, so for us, it's like the idea is, like, maybe when we grow, we grow by, like, just lots of little wineries somewhere else. And then instead of distributing something from New York to California, we could have stuff from California, New York from California, stuff from New York from New York. I always say I'd rather have 12 yurts all over the world than one mansion somewhere. You know, that's kind of like the same. And, and similarly, like I'm starting to make for Ruth, uh, collaborating with winemakers all, all over the planet. Um, this winter I'm making a Ruth with Laurent Kazak in France. And and, uh, and if you guys don't know who he is, he's a winemaker and a distiller and a farmer and a father of our industry, I think. He like is a, yeah, is a, um, and, certain, and certainly I feel that way about him from my um, personal job. Um, but anyway, it, you know, it's, it's, it's better for me, I think, to be worldly than to saturate um, your own backyard, so to speak. Like, I don't really need like a bigger farm necessarily. I just want to go and experiment with cool shit elsewhere and keep, you know, keep it small and not have to worry about having, you know, like a big, you know, what happens when you need a building bigger than this, you know, like that sucks. Like, and you I just feel like you're starting your business yeah. over every time you have to move, you know. And I believe that there is a market, right? You know, I believe that one of the advantages that all of you have, you know, doing this now is that there's a, a really big community of people who are supportive of people who take an ethical and an ethos of taste approach to what they do. And I think it gives opportunity for innovation, which what your what your folks are doing is really innovative in breaking things that I think doesn't happen to them. Go ahead. Yeah, and I think you're not referring to the definition of what you're doing. It's like you were saying, it's like keep it small and there's a word in French, it's artisan. But I think it's like very much what you're doing. And there's such a trend around all natural, but like now like the big group are taking it. Like in France you have Gerard Bertrand. Is this natural wine that are like natural in definition because you don't have like uh, any byproduct uh, no so size but it's I mean all the wine are flash pasteurized is it like natural? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. It's just because it's this big curve. And uh, when you teach people about like natural, and they, I really don't use the word natural. I always make the comparison in terms, like in terms all the people are buying wine in the supermarket. So they're like industrial wine is most of the market are in the supermarket. But those people are going, are going to see their baker buying like bread from their baker, they don't have baker, but they don't. The disconnect is outrageous. Yes. Yeah. And, and because the baker is small, and they won't go like in a supermarket to buy their, their bread. So just like keep it small and stay artisan, you say you're an artist, like it's the same route for the world, I think it should be like you know, the perfect uh, definition. You know, I mean, from my perspective, I mean, I'm a tech guy. What I do is I build web computers online for causes and other things. And I think that there's there's a unique relationship between artisans, people who are making things they love at scales that are by definition have constraints in order to do this unless you stamp them out and do them in other places. And the web has enabled us to create global communities, to build global brands, and people to support you at a scale that's artisanal and make it work. That just wasn't here outside of a village back in the day. And I think that's why there's such innovation going on. I think it's really interesting. Other questions? There's got to be. We're also in a time where there's a super high concentration of young farmers now, which I think is really awesome. Like when I was in high school last year, um, people were asking me, you know, like, what are you going to do? Because you're not going to college. Like, what are you going to mm -hmm. do? And I was like, you know, I don't know. I'm just going to kind of bounce around, like, learn about the world and stuff, and end up, you know, living in Oregon and, and making wine and, and finding so many young people who were in a similar situation where they were like, you know, we just didn't feel like we could take like a prototypical adulthood route. And, you know, and I feel like we're all just like molecules finding our friends, you know, around the world and, and inspiring each other and encouraging each other to do weird shit. And, uh, and, and now, especially in the Hudson Valley where I farm, like Columbia County has like the highest population of young farmers in the whole country. Yeah, and like and everywhere all over the country, like right, like where you guys are, there's so many new young farmers now, right? And I don't know if you guys are kind of helping with that community to build, but yeah. it's super cool That's that really people are abandoning the concept that you know you have that you have to have like a you know a stereotypical American life. I love you know I love that people are getting back to the land because you know this country is just obviously so obsessed with money. Uh, this is like the most like. So Most I, success with money time we could ever live in. I, I have a side question for the four of you that I've been thinking about as I've been listening to you. So, in a way, you have the potential to disrupt our concept of what natural wine is today, right? Not aggressively, not like we want to disrupt it. Expand is a better word. Well, um, I, don't, I, I like it though. I mean, it's evolving, right? So, because I mean, I'm listening to you, and my son is an herbologist, and you know, my life partner is a nutritionist, so I'm very, I'm just latching on to all these things that you're saying, and like, it seems to me that I bet you if we came back in 18 months, you would be having collaborations with great marketers, you know, and talking about bringing some of your knowledge of, you know, herbs and botanicals into another fermentation process which has been shut which has been closed down. Because everyone who, that I've spoken to has said, you know, this is what wine used to be, right? It used to be, um, you know, a vehicle for bringing various things into the body, right? And the water was bad. And so I'm wondering whether or not you think that as time moves on, either you'll do it yourself or you'll build collaborations with um, great winemakers, which is a little bit more complex in a way, or has its own complexity to it that's different, to actually start expanding that statements because there's such innovation already happening in wine with skins and other things as well. I think it would be really interesting um, for, for these things to start to cross pollinate. And you do that a little bit, right? Yeah. Raphael does too and um, and you work with like a bunch of grapes. Well, I, use, I use fox grapes. But they're like I think we all play with grapes. You know it's like it's like the black and it's like you know there's these grapes for a while they they have no sugar. You couldn't make wine out of them. They're way too mm -hmm. acidic but you can add honey to them and then make Wine and we'll see if it's any good. I, th I think the difference. I think the difference is like none of us. It's not our lives aren't built around monoculture. Whereas you know, great winemakers 
their lives are built around this one crop. Mm -hmm. we, see, we see a lot of similarities between the orange wines that are coming out yeah. and our ciders. Yeah, I've so, heard that. Yeah, yeah me too. And um, so we've been doing some experimentation with skin contact with crescent hybrids. You mentioned that when I was tasting your wine. Yeah. So it's, good time. it's like apple skins, right? Well, also actually grapes. We're, we're, yeah. And we're going to do blends of apples and grapes. <laughs> Sorry, didn't you put it? Uh, Andy does a, a bed, right? Uh -huh. a, yeah. And then there's the Pyman, right? The grape and honey yeah. blend, and that's an old ancient beverage. Yeah. 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 So. And something I think winemakers don't do enough is they don't rest their wines on other things. You know, like you could cure apples or, or wild, you know, I find wild fucking quince all over my farm and, and cure them to just, you know, like rest things on it. It's, I mean, it's so awesome and it brings like completely like heavenly aromatics to the table, right? It's like, I mean, I don't think that great winemakers kind of experiment with other, incorporating other plants into, you know, their wines enough. I, you know, I, I, I wish that some of them would. Yeah, so you guys have convinced me. I mean, this has been really interesting to me. Like it's been, um, it's kind of, I thought I was a broad thinker. This has smacked me around a little bit, which, I think, which is really good to me. Um, and because, um, not only way by the products, but I really think that I, I have a little bit of problem with thinking that the, the market needs to meet you halfway. I think it's all responsibility, and I honestly think you all have great stories. I think that um, it's really not being told. You know? I don't think the market has to meet us halfway. I think the producer consumer relationship needs to, to be more integrated. But, yeah. we, but we exist in a three and four tier system. That's correct. So there, you know, okay, so here's, like, here's the question. And then we have to, I okay. we're getting yelled at, but it's just Why? Yeah, it's fine. Why? 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 One yeah. question, though, yeah. that yeah. is, is instead of going through like a certification program, say, for what natural wine is, why not put the ingredients on the label? Oh, that's what all of us want. Well, that's I would great. say, I would even add, I would even add this. Process. Yeah, I would add this. I actually kind of, it's like, for Ruth, she doesn't have to list all her herbs. I kind of like some yeah. of that industry. But I think the thing you said first is really important. You know, when I started, I had a, I had a CSA, which means that all the wine was sold to a club. Basically, once every three or four months, they would get a pack of like four or five different wines. And what that did was it put me as a producer in direct relationship with the consumer, which is a really special relationship of trust, right? And it turns what you're making from a product which is bought by a consumer, which is that's how we are told to think about things. And we're making products which are anonymous and what they call fungible, which means they're kind of interchangeable, they're like blocks. And that you as a consumer go and you go to the supermarket and you like look and you pick up what you like, right? That's not how most food was made, even food like wine and bread and cheese. Like in the most cases, like I was telling you before, you have a town and you, if you were the baker for that town, you had a responsibility to make good bread for them. And it was, it was a relationship of trust. So one of the things that I liked about this place by like pushing the production, like it's not the, this place to do produce wine, you know, we'd be doing it upstate. But like by like doing that, we have a really close relationship yeah. with our consumers. And I think that that overrides all this certification, organic, all that stuff, because I mean, you have to look at them in the eye and tell them when you make it. I get that when I buy a bottle of wine from Mariana Jigger Street. Mm -hmm. These are people who, you know, they connect me to the things I want and I have faith in them. That they're the curators and they're the police. Um, but yeah, everyone's welcome to hang out over there. Uh, we also have, if you're not, if you, I just wanted to mention this because I'm very proud of it. We have the only kvass in New York, which is a non-alcoholic, rye, sour, sour drink, kind of like which or something that's draft. It's really nice. Probiotic drink. Probiotic, yes. Yeah, yeah, so really uh, but also, we're going to taste our stuff if you guys want to hang out with us and just talk. These guys were great. Thank you so much. <laughs>